I want to talk about a topic that um, you may already know about, since most of you are acquainted with what I'm trying to present. But I, I want to present it in a way so that you can go and represent it in your way. I want to help you to help others. And if once you see how this works, and, and it's quite easy once you follow how it works, um, then you will be armed and ready to go, spring-loaded, waiting and praying for the opportunity to let go. You know, when I began ministry in, 19, in, in 1972, a black pastor told me the success to ministry is that you first read yourself full, think yourself straight, pray yourself hot, and then let yourself go. <laughs> read yourself full, think yourself straight, pray yourself hot, and let yourself go. Good counsel. Revelation 8.5 is a passage that puzzles a lot of people. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar of incense. And incidentally, when you see these little brackets, this is where I have inserted words to complete the thought so that you understand uh, what you're seeing and what I'm saying lines up. <coughs> And hurled it on the earth, and there came all over the earth, not just Fort Walton Beach, peals of thunder, rumblings. The word for rumblings is, the Greek word is phoneo. And it's the word that we have used and created to make the telephoneo. Telephone? These rumblings, when this sensor is cast down, earth itself will speak. The rocks will cry out. That's what this is saying. Voices will be heard. And there will be no apparent source for the voices. Is that scary or what? There will be flashes of lightning. And I, 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 I believe that this is a gross understatement. We're talking sheets of fire. Have you ever seen a sheet of, of lightning? Not a bolt, but a sheet it's a, a large panel that just falls from the sky. And it can be several hundred feet in, in width. And it is all fire. Whew. Just incredible power. And what follows is an earthquake. And for reasons that you are about to see, I believe this is a global earthquake. And these events, these events will mark the beginning of the Great Tribulation, day one. And the Great Tribulation is not seven years in length. The Great Tribulation is 1,335 days in length, according to the book of Daniel. All right, what I want to show you is this. Many people have been led to believe these are symbolic peals of thunder, symbolic rumblings, symbolic flashes of lightning, and a symbolic earthquake. Because the book of Revelation is all symbols. You ever hear that? Well, you just start talking, right, Martha? You just talk it around a little bit and everyone will tell you, you can't understand that. It's all symbols and nobody knows what the symbols mean. Okay, so when you say, 
All right. What do these symbols mean? Please show me Bible verses that explain these symbols. You can count on this. You will be met with stony silence because there aren't any relevant texts in the Bible that define such symbols because peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and the global earthquake are not symbolic. Other people will deflect your inquiry saying, well, these things happened a long time ago. Okay, when you ask for historical evidence, you will be met with stony silence again because there is no historical evidence. So please consider how serious this really is. Consider the punishing reality of the following passage which describes the physical appearing of Jesus at the second coming. I'm going to jump down to Revelation 16, verse 17. This puts us at the very end of the age. This puts us at the end of the seven bowls. This puts us at day 1335. I believe, and I believe I can demonstrate this, but I'm not going to take the time tonight, but I believe that the seven bowls, each one lasts 10 days. So, bowl five, bowl six, bowl seven. And so, seven bowls take 70 days. Right? Everyone as, as understands what I'm saying? So, four, three, two, one. And this day here becomes day 1265, which is a Monday. Well, how do I know it's a Monday? Because day 1264 is a Sunday <laughs> when the 144,000 are taken to heaven as first fruits. And the day following Sunday is always what? Monday. Okay. So day 1265 is Monday. Day 1635 is Monday. All right. So these are the seven bowls, and each one lasts ten days. Ten, 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 ten. Now, we're going to look at, right here, we're talking about the last few days. I understand the second coming to be something like this, that at day... 1325, right here, 10 days before we get there, there's going to be a sign in the sky of Jesus appearing. There's going to be a small cloud, and the sign of the Son of Man will begin to be visible. And the kings of the earth are ready and armed and will, are preparing and are watching that cloud because when it gets within range, they're going to attempt to destroy it. Well, if you understood the sixth bowl, how the demons go out to gather the kings of the earth to the battle of Armageddon, then you would understand what this is. This is going to be man versus God inspired and, and, and encouraged and initiated by demons. And the ultimate predators that sinners are will be seen as they attempt to destroy Jesus at his appearing. So about here, day 12, 1325, the sign of the Son of Man begins to appear. And as Jesus and his an en enormous host of angels draw closer to the earth. The cloud gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it is a violent cloud. It is dark 
and lightning is flashing out of it and glory is shining out of it. And it's just a, 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 it looks like a very scary thing. And it's coming to get you. (laughs) That's the good news. (laughs) You want to go home. And as the cloud draws nearer, it spreads out. And it begins to cover and encircle the whole world. And the next thing you know, all of the angels with Jesus who are attending him are all encapsulating the whole world and earth is rotating on its axis inside this ring of angels. And this is why the scripture says about Jesus, every eye will see him. I remember as a little boy thinking, well, if you lived on the bottom of the world and Jesus came at the top of the world, how would you see him? (laughs) You know, Only a kid would have such a question, right? Well, the answer is simple. Jesus sits in a stationary place. All the angels are all around the earth. And this is the source of its glory. And it's just radiating out in every direction. And from east to west, you look up, you look out, you look around. There's angels everywhere. As earth spins on its axis inside this cocoon of angels, every eye will behold not only Jesus, but the glory of the Father. Because when Jesus comes, the Father comes with him. Jesus said, told the high priest, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One. Matthew. So this, this is what is developing right here. So get the picture in your mind. Get, you know, we're, we've got to zoom forward in time and, and understand that this is where Armageddon takes place. This is the battle of Armageddon. It is where... Jesus and his army confront the devil and his armies and the kings of the earth. And guess who wins? In fact, when the battle is over, on the 1334th day, all the wicked are dead, slain in one of two ways. The wicked die at the second coming. Everybody dies, the wicked I'm speaking of, in one of two ways. The Bible says that the wicked who participated with the devil in his efforts to destroy Jesus, the armies, the kings, as they go forth, Babylon, all of, all of Satan's organization, they are thrown into a big lake of fire. So here's a lake of fire. And the others, the other people who are not employees and are not affiliated, but wicked nonetheless, the Bible says the, a sword comes out of the mouth of Jesus and he just commands them to die and they drop dead. So at the second, right here, the day before, the last day, all the wicked are, are destroyed. There are no wicked people left alive. They're all dead. What happens on day 1335? This is when Jesus resurrects all the righteous. And the, the living saints, both of them, will be excited. (laughs) You missed that. (laughs) The living saints, which will be few in number, very few, but they will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air on day 1335, and they are going to return 
to heaven for 1,000 years. They've got business to take care of during the 1,000 years that's coming. And their primary business, and, the, and it's described in the Bible as reigning with Christ. Well, what is there to reign over if they're all dead? What is there, what business is there left to do? Because the judgment, the eternal destiny of everyone was determined way back over here at day 1260 when mercy ended. So what is there left for the saints to do? What, how can you reign over a bunch of dead people? Well, remember with God, death is not permanent. What the saints are going to do during the thousand years, they're going to sit in judgment on every wicked person, not to determine his eternal destiny, not to determine whether he lives or dies. No, but rather, this is the issue. Restitution. God has a law that says, as you do unto others, it must be done unto you. It's called the golden rule. As you do unto others, it will be done unto you. The whole idea of restitution is this. If a person was really mean and harmful and hurt others, and he never made it right, he did not make restitution in this life, then God is going to raise him up at the end of the thousand years, and he's going to make him pay for what he did. See, in God's economy, no one gets away with murder. No one gets away being a thief. No one gets away with anything. Justice will be served. <clears throat> so, the wicked, the saints, are going to sit with Jesus in judgment, to reign in judgment with Jesus to determine how much restitution this person must repay. So, at the end of the thousand years, when the wicked are resurrected and they're brought up out of the ground, Jesus then tells each wicked person, now justice will be served. You will repay all the wickedness and all the harm and all the heart hurt that you imposed on others, I'm now imposing it in, in payback for you. This is called justice. This is, this is called judicial equilibrium. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Bruise for bruise. This is God's system of justice. And so people like, let's take Hitler, let's take Adolf Eichmann, let's take, uh, you know, uh, Goebbels or others who, who were terribly uh, evil in World War II. And, and, and they, they short-circuit justice by shooting themselves in the head or, or taking a cyanide pill or whatever, thinking that they're going to get away without having to face Judgment Day. But I've got a surprise for those guys because payday is someday. And there's where payday will occur. And so after this wicked person is set on fire and after he has suffered as the saints determined with Jesus, then he will be burned up, reduced to ashes, and is never more to be heard from. And the universe will finally be clean of sin. And in the process, justice was met in every case. Think about this for a minute. Let's suppose you get to heaven. 
Let me say that a little more positively. <laughs> let's say you are in heaven. And let's suppose after a couple of thousand years, after all this is over, you get to thinking about Uncle Bob, who is, didn't make it. And so you want to go investigate <clears throat> Uncle Bob's life. <coughs> you want to investigate Uncle Bob's judgment. And you want to see, was he treated fair? Did God give him every benefit of the doubt? Did God give him every grace? Well, with God, there is no doubt. God sees everything. With God, the record is unvarnished. The recording angels can see motive. They can see action. They can see thoughts. They can see words. And it's all recorded. So you go into the, the, to the um, audiovisual room in heaven. You put in Uncle Bob's DVD. And you kick back on the big couch to watch his life Oh, you've got 70 years to burn. Let's just watch the whole thing in real time. Hit the remote, and away we go with Uncle, the adventures of Uncle Bob. And, and, and what's really neat, you, you get to see exactly what Uncle Bob thought. You get to see what Uncle Bob knew to be right. In other words, God's record of every person destroyed is so complete that anything you want to know can be answered. No questions left. God has done this so that throughout eternity, no questions about his fairness, no questions about his government, no questions about his mercy, will ever exist. How transparent can God be? And so at the end of watching a whole 70 years in real time, you leave the AV room praising God that he could not save Uncle Bob. Because, and I say this not to be flippant, but Every saint that makes it to heaven is going to be delighted and thrilled to know that there will be no more predators in heaven. There will be no more defiance in heaven. There will be no more of this rebellion ever again. Now, will the saints feel sad? They will for a while, and this is why the Bible says God will wipe away every tear. God understands our emotional connections and our emotional love. He understands the, you know, the love that we have for our family and friends and those we know. And so God gives us time to grieve for those who chose not to come. How generous. But once, once the emotional tide of grief subsides, the realities of what God has done and the beauty of what God has done all begin to make perfect sense. It's quite a story. And I've just scratched the surface, but I, I wanted to introduce this part of the story to you so that you, as we're, as we're working on the seven bowls here, I wanted you to see how, when we come to the end of the story, why the saints are going to be lifted up the day after all the wicked are destroyed. God wants, God wants the living saints, both of them, to see with their own eyes his destruction of the wicked. And then he resurrects those who have been sleeping like Abel, 
the first man to die. He then resurrects all the righteous from all the ages, and they ascend to heaven first, and then those of us, Paul says, which are alive and remain, we will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and then this verse will be fulfilled. In John 14, <clears throat> Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be where? With me that you also may be where I am. Let's take a 15-minute break, and then we will resume.